My name is Laura Lee Johnson. I'm the Associate Director for the Division of Biometrics 3 at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Our disclaimer is the general one. None of us, of course, that work for the government get to actually reflect the views or have it construed as the views of the government, even though we work for them. I apologize that I had a death in my family last week, so I just got back today and finished our slides today, which is why they were very late. So I know you all don't like it. For those of you that are seeing the live lecture to get the slides so late, that's totally my fault but hopefully you can forgive me for the reason that that happened. If you're pulling the slides off from online, you'll notice it didn't say Summary Module 1 because as I stood in the back and looked at the slides on something other than my little laptop, I realized I saw the title for the slide deck that I had used the, um, all of the backgrounds for. So um, this is, in fact, Module 1, and this is what you should see on your third slide, which is an overview slide. Another quick comment that I wanted to make, which is I wasn't able to get online over the weekend to pull up the questions that hadn't yet been answered in the online forums. So we only get about two weeks from the live lecture in order to actually answer questions. So when they get posted later in that time frame, we always don't get a chance to log in and actually post an answer to your question. So any of the questions from module one that didn't get answered or you still are a little bit confused by something, post them onto the board for this summary lecture. And if it's not a question for me, but for another lecture, just note that in your comment and we'll try to tag down the person who gave that lecture and make sure that we get you an answer. All right, so any questions that didn't get answered, I know there were a couple in my lectures, at least that that happened, make sure to repost them to this board. So if you'll remember back to the first lecture that I gave, I talked about the fact that we have a lot of different people taking this course. Kind of real time, we have over 7,000 people signed up for this course, though those of you in the room don't see a lot of folks. For some folks, this is a very early introduction. For others, this is a very advanced lecture. So we have to try to hit a lot of different places. This really is more of a tricks, tips, concepts. If you want to understand and be an epidemiologist, be a biostatistician, if you're not one already, you probably need to go take actual coursework at a university or someplace like that in order to develop those skills. What we try to cover is a lot of the type of stuff that didn't get taught in those classes. So our general objectives are that in this first part of the course, you all become better consumers of the medical and scientific literature. And as you go on and you start hearing the lectures about the Institutional Review Board, the review of human subjects, work like that, and you start hearing about how to apply for grants, so you can also better review that information and give feedback and better write that information as you're going on in your research careers. But even if you don't have a research career and all you need to do is read the newspaper, we want you to be more educated reader there also. We're hoping to enhance the conversations inside the research teams and with the first part of this first module, also with your study statisticians and epidemiologists. But as you're moving forward in your course, this idea of enhancing conversations, whether it is with ethicists and with other people, it's a really important concept we hope that people get. And realistically, at the end of the day, we all want better science. So when Dr. Gallen started the course, he told you that we had all these different modules. So if you look at this, it's a lot of information, isn't it, that you all have learned. Congratulations, you've gone pretty far. You have a ways to go, but this is the really tough stuff. Now, even the folks that teach the later lectures talk about that. They're like, this part is hard, but we think it's a fundamental aspect that'll help you better understand a lot of the questions and problems that come up in the other lectures. So we talked a little bit about the efficient clinical designs, how you choose a research question, one of the most important elements that comes up. What is your question? Is something that I actually give a lot of talks about but I sometimes want to kind of shake my investigators on, I'll be honest. And I ask myself that too. It's like you talk, you have this whole meandering conversation, but what at the end of the day is the question you're trying to answer? 
Then we did an overview of clinical study designs and then went specifically into some of these observational or epidemiologic study designs. We talked and you had a patient come in to talk to you about the patient perspective for clinical research. It's really important, and this is a bigger and bigger push around the world, to have that patient voice in the development, not only the research questions and of the trials, but also thinking about your endpoints, which is something you all have talked about the last few weeks. So Kate Stoney came in and talked to you about study participant selection. Why do you decide to put certain people in your trial or not in your trial? And that's true whether it's a randomized study or an observational study. Then Paul Joachim came in and talked a little bit more about issues in randomization and gave you a brief overview of hypothesis testing. Again, there are many years of lectures that could be given on how to do hypothesis testing, but this was a general overview. We came in and talked about sample size and power, both for anything from a phase one trial to really large studies. You're going to hear more about that towards the end of the course when we start talking about more community participatory research and some of those larger studies that happen in real world settings. Then we went on and talked a little bit about survival analysis. Again, something you could spend years of your life on, but we wanted you to be able to read the medical literature a little bit better. And sometimes when you see those Kaplan-Meier curves realize maybe that's not the analysis that should have been done. Or maybe it's perfect because I can do it on the napkin on top of that. Then we spent a lot of time talking about measures. So Dave Luckenbaugh talked a little bit about the validity and reliability issues and how those are so important when trying to choose what to measure and how it impacts a lot of these other questions, your ability to do the hypothesis testing, how big or small your sample size may need to be. Then Kevin Weinford came and talked about quality of life and patient reported outcomes and other topics like that. Barbara Stussman came in to talk about designing and testing questionnaires, and there was probably a lot of information that seemed pretty similar there, and it should, because whether you're talking about a survey, a patient-reported outcome, a clinician-reported outcome, anything like that, good development is pretty much the same. Then last week, you heard from Leighton Chan about using some of these large data sets for population-based health research. So he does a lot of work with what's called secondary data. And in the United States, people may use Medicare claims and information like that, but this is also work that's done in various parts of the world using different but similar data sets. And then the last lecture you've had was Chuck Natanson talking about meta-analysis and a different type of secondary data analysis, this time using clinical trials. So what I did for this summary lecture, usually I pulled together a lot of information on my own. But given that richness, Daniel and I emailed all of the other lectures and said, what should the students know? If I'm giving a summary, give me a two to six slide summary of what you taught. If you had a chance to go back and tell them something again, what would you tell them? So I made a couple of edits on here, but in general, these are actually their slides that they sent me although I also reordered them a little bit to tell the story. So one of the places we started is that it's really easy to write, that you're going to use a randomized, double-blind, controlled, parallel arm design and an intent-to-treat analysis. Hopefully now, compared to October, you know what each of those words mean. It's also easy to say that subjects and participants are going to be consented. And as you go through the next few months and the next few modules of this course, you'll realize it's really hard to adequately consent to people. So it's really not easy to implement and maintain the integrity of your randomization. Dr. Joaquim talked about that quite a bit. To maintain the integrity of your blinding or your masking. You know, I have a study where because of the substance that they're taking in one of the study arms, one of their basic blood values always changes. Their creatinine changes. Every time you go get blood work done, pretty much, they're checking your creatinine. So how do you blind that study? 
when people have very different side effect profiles depending on the therapies that they're taking? How do you blind the study? So we talked about various different tricks that can be used, and your textbook talks about some of those too. And maybe, in fact, you're going to have assessors that are blinded or other folks that are blinded. It's hard to maintain your multiple study arms, especially let's say that you're giving a, a psychological-based therapy and control group. And there's some studies they look back and they look at videos of the control arm therapy sessions and the new intervention arm therapy sessions and realize those are starting to look an awful lot alike. How do you maintain the integrity of your processes over time? How do you maintain the integrity of data collection when your power goes out, when you don't have an internet connection? How are you going to do that? There are a lot of issues that come up in trying to figure out how you have all of these different fail-safes or problems that can occur. And then trying to actually transfer data from, to the regulatory and other types of groups that are going to need it. Did you remember in the consent form to even tell people that those regulatory agencies may see their data? That's actually a more common problem than you may think. The regulatory agency requests, and in fact requires in many cases, that primary data. But you didn't tell people in the consent form that you were going to send it or allow these regulatory agencies to look at that primary data. So what happens? In many cases, you have to go out and reconsent everybody. That's, in fact, what happens. But the real fundamental element here that I think almost all of us have talked about is how good is your primary research question? At the end of the day, you do all this research. The data is analyzed. Well, the answer, regardless of what it is, to the primary research question actually advance scientific knowledge or change clinical practice. Now, I'm sure that Chuck talked a lot about the fact that don't let one study change everything that you do in most cases, because that usually just leads to bad things. But sometimes we choose not a big enough or important enough question. We're so focused on what we want our own research to go along we don't realize maybe it's time to change course. So as a reviewer, one of the most important things you can do is tell people no. You know, you don't want to just say no, 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 no. But sometimes you say, you know, it's not that this is an incremental step that must happen in order to take the next big step. Sometimes that's the case. But nobody cares about the results of your study. You don't want to say that because your best friend is doing something in competition, but sometimes you look at these studies, you're like, you should just stop. And you have to have the guts to tell people in your reviews that that's the case. So a good primary research question is answering a question that people care about, not just you and your study team. So also don't forget, we have people call it PICO or PICOT, different ways that they look at it, but it's basically any time you're trying to describe a study, you want to list the population or the disease, the intervention or that variable of interest, the comparison group that you're going to be also describing, what is the outcome, and then you should usually also give some measure of time. So an example of this, like in this population, how does this intervention compared to the control, influence the outcome during some time period. Now, maybe it's not an intervention. Maybe you say, in people with sickle cell disease, how does being male compared to being female influence this outcome during this time period? So this works, whether it's a randomized, a non-randomized, an observational, et cetera, study. Don't need an intervention here. But an example from Stillwell is in patients 65 and older, that's your population, how does the use of an influenza vaccine, that's your intervention, compared to not receiving the vaccine, that's your control, influence their risk of developing pneumonia? How are we going to measure that outcome? An important thing to understand in your study during the flu season. 
Again, this is something you need to define a little bit better. The northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, who's defining the flu season. But this gives you a general idea that you can then drill down all the little bits. But this gets back to this question that people get confused about with the controls and interventions. The specific question that's being addressed in the study is what leads to the choice of your control group or groups, sometimes you need more than one, for the study. You have to make sure when you're comparing people in the intervention group and the control group or in your cases and in your controls that there is something that you can define that is different about them. Maybe it's the fact that these folks went to yoga class six days a week for an hour and these other folks just read a book six days a week for an hour. Like there's something that has to define them as being a case or a, being in the intervention group versus being a control. Many times it's a lot easier to decide what your interventions are supposed to be. People are like, oh, I spent all this time writing all these manuals, developing this new drug, doing all this stuff. It's a lot easier to do that compared to figuring out what a good control is. Because if you look back at those early lecture notes, you'll see, like, you know, are you controlling for time? Are you controlling for attention? Are you controlling for the number of pills people have to swallow? How frequently they swallow? Are you just controlling for ingestion of something? If, you're con if you have an IV versus a pill, is it just really that method that you're administering the same drug? What is it that you're trying to do? Figuring out your control arms, especially kind of non-drug, non-biologic studies, is really hard but it's really important to make sure you can do your analysis at the end of the day. So when in doubt, write out your table, write up a mock article about the study, write your manuscript to make sure you can actually say and analyze everything you want to do before you enroll your first patient. Or rather, check it before you enroll your first patient. And now you have a nice template that you can change when you're actually done with your study. So we talked a little bit about effect modification. This is a nice way of saying interaction or synergy. Trick with effect modification is it could be larger or smaller. So this is when the association between your outcome and some other variable, maybe it's the intervention, maybe it's sex, it's something else, is modified by different levels of a third variable. The example that we talked about was smoking, asbestos, and lung cancer. So smoking increases your risk of lung cancer by a certain amount. Asbestos exposure also increases your risk of lung cancer by a certain amount. But if you're both a smoker and had asbestos exposure, it's not an additive amount. So don't get effect modification confused with confounding. So I think probably Dr. Stoney also talked about confounding to say one reason you may have certain exclusion criteria is to reduce the confounding in a study. So confounding, you again have these two or more variables. You're lucky when they're known. You're unlucky when they're unknown in a study. And you have confounding when their effects on that common response variable or outcome are kind of mixed together. So we talked about the coffee and the smoking pancreatic cancer example. But I think the simplest example is really the match example, which we'll go to on the next slide. The idea in confounding is this association between the exposure and the outcome is misestimated. So in effect modification, I may have different rates if it was going to be I was a smoker but didn't have asbestos exposure. I had asbestos exposure but wasn't a smoker versus I had both asbestos and smoking, it's not simply additive. There's something extra that happens. And confounding, I just have a misestimate. It's very simple. So the problem is, and this is kind of the easy one to remember, I see an association between carrying matches in your pocket and lung cancer. It's not really the carrying the matches in your pocket that causes the lung cancer. It's because it's confounded by some other unmeasured variable, which is basically if I'm carrying matches in my pocket, more likely I'm smoking cigarettes or cigars or something else, so I'm using the matches to light it, and it's that substance that's actually what's 
leading to the lung cancer. So remember, good primary outcome measures, any measure needs to be clinically meaningful and simple. You don't want 20 million clauses to understand your measure. But sometimes, you know, just saying matches in their pocket might be too simple of a measure. Another one that used to come up, they're like, oh, do they have yellowing on their fingers? Because that was from holding the cigarette, so they had the tobacco left on it. But again, like that's not what was actually the problem. So you have two different types of research studies. You've got the observational studies where I'm going to observe and collect data on all these different characteristics of interest, but I'm not supposed to be influencing the environment, the disease course, the participant. I'm merely supposed to observe. Then I have experimental studies. Here I'm deliberately trying to influence the course of events. I want to change something here, to change the course of disease, to change what have you. I tend to carefully select my population of subjects. I kind of do that in both types of studies. But when we do these experimental trials on humans, we call them clinical trials or clinical studies. Some people will say clinical studies cover everything, clinical trials have to be randomized kind of loosey-goosey. NIH has some very specific definitions, but so do other bodies. So observational studies. We talked about the case report and case series. Remember the HIV case series? That's a case series. So when you're just writing up basically a set of patient reports, but you're going to comment on the same characteristics measured in the same way, etc. Then we talked about cross-sectional or prevalent surveys. So I'm going to do a snapshot and ask people a series of questions, hopefully that have been gone through by, by Ms. Stussman, so she's made sure that, in fact, everybody understands them. You have a case control study. So case control study, you might collect a group of cases, let's say those women that had that very rare vaginal cancer, and a set of controls, people who don't have that vaginal cancer. So when you're choosing cases and controls, it tends to be based on some disease. And then you look through to see what characteristics are the same or different between these groups of people. In their case, it was a drug that their mothers took during gestation. A cohort study is kind of like those prevalent surveys, except now I'm doing it longitudinally. The cohort studies are movies. And I'm going to keep asking those same questions and doing the same measures over and over and over. So the cardiovascular health study. Every six months, people went through a battery of measurements. They had imaging, they had blood drawn, they asked them a bunch of questions. So they had some things done every 12 months, other things done every six months. But they did that for a decade. That's a longitudinal study. Natural history studies, that's something that the NIH Clinical Center does quite a bit of. And you'll see this a lot in rare diseases. In some ways, kind of ties up a little bit closer to those case reports and case series. But here what we're doing, it is a lot of times like these longitudinal cohort studies where we're writing up the natural history of disease. We're not quite sure what's going to come yet, so I may not have a fixed set of measures quite yet. I may be adding to those over time. And then we have the ecological studies. The ecological studies are when I'm going to take maybe nation level data, so data on the population, those summaries instead of individual level data. So some of the maternal health information you see are really ecological studies, not individual level studies. If you're going to look at, say, death rates of women during labor or due to labor. So what is epidemiology? It assumes that disease has some causal or preventative factors that can be identified through a systematic investigation. That's the basic definition. Then you move into these quasi-experimental, single-arm, not randomized experimental studies. So first I observe everybody, then I start to intervene. But maybe I don't really have a control. It might be early in the investigation, 
may be a rare disease. There could be lots of different reasons that I do this type of study. But it's pretty low level evidence here, right? Sometimes folks say they're gonna have some type of concurrent control group. So they're just going to choose one, say, side of a hospital corridor and they're gonna treat all those patients in one way. And the people in rooms on the other side of the corridor, they're gonna treat them in a different way. Maybe that's whether they're giving them baths on a daily basis, something like that. So they're not randomizing it, they're just assigning it. Well, at least you have some type of control, but it's not a very good control. Then you have what are called historically controlled studies, where you may have a lot of missing data, poor data, and non-comparability again, but those historically controlled studies might be patients from the past. They could be the control arm from a previously randomized study, but somehow you have patients and you have data that you're recycling from one study or from hospital records to another. You tend to see this a lot in your rare disease or pediatric trials. But, you know, anytime you have to start cutting corners, you realize you could be getting the wrong information. So in this intervention-based spectrum, you have these quasi-experimental studies and preclinical studies and phase zero or kind of like, that's like your low level information. It's useful for something, but you wanna move forward. Phase one tends to be that early dose toxicity type of information. Phase two is when you start moving more towards efficacy, although you're keeping an eye on safety, and now you're exposing more people to this experimental therapy. In current stage, stage two, I'm sorry, phase two designs, we tend to have control groups. In the past, they were less frequent. In fact, now we even have control groups in a lot of phase one studies. But in phase two, you're not just looking for, you know, such a bad toxicity that you stop. Remember phase one, some of those studies have these maximum tolerated dose. Phase two, we've chosen maybe two to three doses or a few more that we're testing out in larger groups of people. Phase three is supposed to be your definitive study. So you better have figured out everything you wanted to know in phase two. Because phase three is basically supposed to be confirming all that information you figured out in phase two. Do I have the right dose? Am I seeing the same impacts? Sometimes in phase two, we may stop or do our study with an outcome that's more of a biomarker. So it's kind of our surrogate endpoint. It's kind of partway there, whereas phase three might go for survival or for some type of long-term endpoint. Phase four tends to be kind of post-marketing studies or something is released to the public. We now want to see how it's doing in a much broader group of people. So how does it behave in the real world? tends to be more phase four. This is also your long-term safety studies. So what'll happen in all those phases earlier is people become very pristine about who they want in their study. Their inclusion exclusion criteria, in my opinion, many times are way too strict. So you're choosing it for safety, you're choosing it for a lot of other reasons, but phase three even, they may decide to not have anybody with any comorbid conditions in the study. You can only have the disease of interest. If you're trying to study something like hypertension, that's a pretty rare group of people to have. So part of us tend to push to say in phase three, you need to have a wider spectrum of people, even in phase two, to figure out how are these drugs behaving. But in phase four is where you really figure it out. Who's being prescribed a medication and how do they behave? And towards the end of the course, we'll talk more about dissemination implementation and comparative or cost-effectiveness studies. Those also tend to happen in that phase four time point. But if you're smart, you're thinking about those studies early on and how you're gonna implement them. Because you don't wanna develop a therapy that can never be used. So you've gotta think about how are folks gonna be trained to perform the surgical procedure? Can I produce more than two devices a year? Does it use such rare minerals that you can't do that? So you've got to think about the production aspects for whatever your intervention is. Even if it's training people on a certain type of yoga or meditation, how are you going to train a lot of people on that if it does great things? 
But when you're trying to decide between a non-randomized and randomized study, you need to remember non-randomized studies can only show association and you're never going to know all those possible confounders we talked about. It was kind of easy to figure out that you left out smoking. That's a rare but easy example. In a randomized study, you can show association and causality if you have a well-done non-adaptive randomization because the unknown confounders should not create problems. Remember, however, it doesn't mean that they won't create problems. It means they should not create problems. The reason I say non-adaptive randomization here is that many of those adaptive randomizations and adaptive designs rely upon your actually knowing what those confounders are and how they're going to be behaving. Otherwise, it screws up your actual randomization or allocation to the study arms. So whenever people are talking about studies, they have this gold standard. You have this treatment control trial with parallel arms. There's a superiority, assess or a superiority hypothesis. It's prospectively designed so you're collecting your data over time, looking towards the future. It's double blind or masked, and it's randomized. So we went through a whole set of different randomized studies. We talked about each of them with some examples. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the adaptive designs because they're so popular. But first, I'm going to talk about intent to treat, because no matter what study design you're doing, you have to figure out who you are analyzing. Now, intent to treat is talked about mainly with randomized studies, although to a certain extent, it applies to observational studies, too. At what point in time is someone included in the analysis? You have to define this in any study protocol and statistical analysis plan that you work on. If you have a randomized study, though, the idea is that once randomized, always analyzed. You assume that they adhered to the study regimen you assigned them to, and you assume they completed the study. Even if you know the pharmacy accidentally mailed them the wrong study drug, and by the way, they dropped out after six days. Why? Because that's real life. So if you're trying to think about how things will happen in real life, in real life, people do not tell you or do not do what you tell them to. In real life, mistakes happen. In a clinical trial, you are probably in the most pristine environment ever. So if you can't find a difference there, it might be that you'll see one in real life, but the chances are probably pretty rare. Now, where it did happen, actually, was in some acupuncture studies in Germany. All of their really carefully run phase three trials weren't showing very many differences, but when they actually did a large-scale effectiveness study across the country, they did see differences. So again, you never quite know. But in general, ITT is what you're supposed to do. This modified intent to treat analysis, or MITT, sometimes is brought up and they say we're only going to include people who started the intervention they're assigned to. Typically, your statisticians are going to get a little jumpy when you start saying this. Some folks say you can only do this when it's double blind. Other folks say you should never do this at all. Because folks may go, just because you think it's double blind doesn't mean someone has not gone and figured out what drug they're taking or they know they're in yoga, but they want to take Tai Chi. You've got to figure out if they're dropping out for other reasons. Completers or adherers analysis. These are usually proposed, especially for mechanistic studies, but when you do this, and then again, though, you have to define what is a completer or adherer. Is it going to 70% of your classes? Is it taking 50% or more of your medication? Is it filling out your daily diary six to seven days every week? What is it? But then you're only studying the well-behaved. And anyone who's a clinician, or if you're honest with yourself about how you behave, probably knows that most people are not so well-behaved. So what's with the masking and the blinding? Well, here, while it's less common in non-randomized studies, you still sometimes in those non-randomized studies want to mask the outcome assessors to the hypothesis. That way, they're not asking the questions of the cases a lot more forcefully than they're asking the controls in that case control study you're running. But in any study, you have to specify who's going to be masked, 
Why are they masked? How are you accomplishing this? And what are they blind to? What information are they not supposed to know? Because somebody's got to know something. It's just you may not let anybody know all the information. You need to assess the effectiveness of masking. Now, Consort took that out of their diagram a few years ago. But realistically, it's important early in your study and towards the end of the study to assess the effectiveness of your masking. Because if you find out that everybody is unblind, then you need to own up to that, and it might be impacting the results of your trial. You need to specify the criteria for unmasking and the people that will be unmasked. So let's say I'm in a drug study and I need to have emergency surgery. It's a double-blind trial. Well, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, they may need to know what drug I'm on. I don't need to know. Probably a lot of people involved in the trial don't need to know either, although the people that are doing the safety assessments and the DSMB, that Data Safety Monitoring Board that Pam Shaw will be talking about in a couple of months, they will probably want to know. So who knows what? And how do we determine that they need to know it? And who's going to tell them? That all needs to be laid out in your protocol. You want to mask the determination of the outcome, typically, for your study so that reviewers are unaware of the treatment assignment. Again, everything here is like playing secret agent. It's all need to know basis in a study. But in the end, somebody needs to know. So what is being adapted in those adaptive trials? Sometimes you have adaptive randomization. Sometimes it's adaptive dose finding. Sometimes you drop the loser or pick the winner out of those different doses. Sometimes you do an adaptive, seamless phase two, phase three trial. Sometimes I'm doing biomarker adaptive. So depending on how you show up with this panel of biomarkers, I decide what treatment or what study arms you're allowed to go into. So I spy and I spy two and some other studies have done things like this. Group sequential methods are technically adaptive design. Remember when I talked about kind of taking peeks at the data and how you had to change your type one error for the end of the trial and it is part of what goes into your sample size calculations? That's a randomized study design. It's a really good one, commonly used in clinical research. And sometimes we're doing sample size recalculation. So we go in, we re-estimate the variance across the entire study population for that outcome and then we update our sample size. So depending on what's being adapted, depends on what you want to do and the problems you're going to have. But you need to think about, for all these adaptations, the reproducibility. Throughout everything in your study design, you've got to be thinking about reproducibility. You need a well-defined cohort. Can someone else, would they make the same decision to include or exclude that same person? If you're hit by a bus, is the next person running that study going to run it the same way? You know, suddenly, your yoga teacher's mother is sick, and she, you need someone to replace her to keep running those classes. Is that person going to run the class the same way? Your drug manufacturer has to shut down suddenly. Is somebody else going to be able to produce the drug the same way or the control substance? The outcomes, you have to be really, really precise. And I know that Dave talked about this some, how you are going to measure the outcome. Not only is it a good measure, but you've got to make sure if you have six different people that are running and taking those measurements, that they would take them the same way. If you're going to do blood pressure, for example, there are different cuff sizes. There are different ways that you can be laying or standing. All of this information impacts that outcome. Are you taking it once? Are you taking it three times and averaging it together? Are you dropping the lowest one, the highest one? What are you going to do? The study data and the study analyses, is everything written down in detail enough that people know who should be in the analysis data set, who should be out? What variables they're supposed to use and the exact code that they need to type in to make the analyses run? There's a lot of places where this falls apart. 
And sometimes you may give some nice little fancy laboratory name and folks all say, we know what that is. And one person will let it incubate for 30 minutes and another person lets it incubate for an hour. And they use slightly different temperatures. Even though technically it is the same procedure, you now have very different study results. You need to be precise about everything. It is painful, but I'm serious. Like I shouldn't just be able to rerun your statistical analyses or create a database for you. I should be able to run your entire study. I am not a phlebotomist. I do not know how to use a DEXA machine, although I vaguely know what, what, what it would look like. But like seriously, you wanna know like a high schooler coming in off the street could run your study pretty much if they had the correct credentials. But you want anybody to be able to do it. That's reproducibility of measurements. There are also a lot of biases that happen in clinical research but we have supposed remedies for these, right? There's the selection and assignment bias that several of us talked about. Well, we try to do randomization if we possibly can in order to help compensate for that. You have these treatment and assessment biases. Well, then we try to mask the research team to what that, per what that individual subject in the study is taking. We have a response bias, so we try to mask the participant so they don't say, well, I know I was getting this, so I'll talk, my pain feels much better. Problem is, though, is that sometimes people feel guilty because those nice people have been trying so hard, so they start saying that they are feeling better anyway. Sometimes it's just a placebo response. Again, it depends on what your question is. If I'm in real life and I'm a payer, I'm an insurance company, as long as the person's feeling better and functioning better, why do I care what caused it? Unless you're charging me a ton of money for nothing. So there are biases that happen during that data cleaning. And sometimes we still need to mask that assigned treatment and all that pre-specified information. Like we set up a role of like, these are the rules of when I'm going to go back and check certain data points. These are the rules of how I'm going to decide that that is an uninterpretable squiggle or an interpretable squiggle. Because sometimes people will say, oh, is that 180 or 130? Well, they were in the, the new study arm, so because they're on the new treatment, I bet that's a 130, not a 180. You don't want that for your systolic blood pressure, for example. During the analysis, the reason you want intent to treat analysis and that pre-specification of all of those analyses is you don't want people to kind of pick up biases and go hunting for the answer that they want to be true. Because we also joke about this, like, you know, you keep looking and once you found what you were expecting to find, you stop looking, you stop doing all these extra analyses, right? No, that's not what you want to do. We do it all the time, but it's wrong. Publication bias. It's the reason we have all these registries for trials around the world. WHO has one. There's one here um, via National Library of Medicine. Clinicaltrials.gov is that one. There are tons of them around. And the reason that we worry is because we know, and I'm sure Dr. Dayton talked about that last night, that there are a lot of these studies that never get published or they don't publish well. So then you find an abstract that someone gave or maybe the animal data fills in the missing information. And actually, a lot of those animal studies are not in these trial registries. Then we have a reporting bias. You measured 40 different hormones and various other things in the blood. And your paper talks about 10. This is another place you have to have pre-specification and disclosure. The reason people get all worried about the multiplicity and type 1 error and issues like that is because they're afraid you're only going to report what looks significant and not the whole story. So remember, we have all those folks with the disease, condition, or disorder. Then you've got the people interested in participating in your trial. Then the people who meet your inclusion exclusion criteria. Then those who consent. And then after that, the people you actually randomize. This is another part of bias too. 
So while we may hold up randomized trials as that gold standard, they're still not always representative of the full population. So a little bit more about that randomization. So what did Dr. Wapim cover? Talked about what does the word random actually mean? What are we talking about? What is randomization? Why you should randomize? Whom and what to randomize? Or who and what to randomize? And how to randomize? He made a lot of recommendations. Use a computer program or online tools. You know, I actually like kind of drawing numbers out of a hat. It is not really a very good form of randomization. Use an online tool. When in doubt, use Permuta block randomization with small random block sizes. So maybe it's blocks of 8 and 10. Maybe it's blocks of 3 and 9. But something, or not 3 and 9, let's say 6 and 9. But do something like that. For a multi-site clinical trial, use site as a stratification variable. And when you stratify on it, it needs to be your statistical model. However, do not use too many stratification variables. You don't want to stratify your study and your randomization in particular on sex and the biomarker and the site and all this other stuff. You're not going to end up with enough people in each of those little holes. Unless necessary, unless you have the resources to do it adequately, avoid adaptive randomization methods. Are they more popular? Are they more common? Yes. Are they a lot easier to screw up? The answer is also yes. There's some institutions where people are going to do them really well. But some of the better people in the field will say, if you don't have the support for it and you don't know enough about the population you're working in, don't go here. So let's say, though, you are going to do a complex randomization method. Get ready to hire a biostatistician who actually understands how to do them. Now also remember here that biostatisticians, they're like doctors. They all have kind of a general knowledge, but that doesn't mean that they specialize in certain things. So they may have some information, they may be able to read the information faster, but you know, you don't want to necessarily ask a gastroenterologist to deliver your baby. They may have done it a couple of times, but especially if they were in medical school and did their residency, 20 or 30 years ago, that's probably not the right person unless you don't have a choice. So you've got to think about, you know, there's some folks that are, they, we call them jack of all trades here. You know, they do a little bit of everything. They keep up on a lot of things. They might be able to know it or at least know who to contact, but some of this stuff gets really scary very quickly. And so it might be easy and uncomplicated and no problem, but that's not always the case. So you've got to be able to understand when you're getting in trouble. And that's the hardest thing and true for everything that we do in all our professions. So what are the implementation recommendations for randomization? We talk about this in the textbook. You've got to make it possible to reproduce the string of treatment assignments. Again, reproducibility. I need to make sure you weren't cooking the books, essentially is what number one is saying when I go in and do an audit of your study. Number two, part of, again, making sure books weren't cooked, you've got to be documenting the randomization method that you used. I don't want to come talk to you afterwards and you tell me you don't know if you strat did a stratified randomization or not. Because I did that once, it was not pretty. Put in place features that prevent the treatment assignment until conditions for the entry in the trial are fully satisfied. So I just studied once with some very illustrious group. They were not confirming inclusion exclusion until about a month after people had been randomized and were started on trial. They're like, oh, but then we'll just exclude them. But they technically also had labeled it an intent to treat analysis. I'm like, you've just undermined the entire randomization. Like, you can't do this comparison. You're wrong. Yeah, someone's making a face in the room. That's right. Uh, my face was not very pretty. And they fought and fought and fought about this. Like, we've been doing, we always do it this way. And I'm like, well, you're wrong. Make sure that someone cannot be assigned, they cannot be randomized until you are sure that they are, in fact, even eligible for your study in the first place. You went to blind assignments to everyone concerned. 
Randomization and blinding are two different elements, but they go hand in hand in helping to maintain the study integrity. You wanna make it difficult, if not impossible, to predict future assignments from past assignments. Remember, that's part of the point of randomization. It's not going A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. The reason that you have those multiple block sizes, things like that, is so that people can't figure out what the next assignment's gonna be. They don't figure out where they wanna put their ant flow in into that study. And you wanna put in place procedures for monitoring the departures from established protocols. If someone got assigned at the wrong time to the wrong arm, all of that, you need a procedure to recognize that and to document that. So we had three different lectures on measurement and a few others that touched on the topic. Dave sent me a handful of slides. His big focus was really reliability and validity, right? So what are the problems in reliability? You have a lack of reliability introduces a lot of error into your measurement. You've got a lot less sensitive statistics. You're gonna need a much larger sample size. And if the worst thing happens, you've got completely uninterpretable results. So he gave this lovely little picture, kind of your minimum total sample size you need, kind of regardless of everything else, based on the reliability coefficient. So he showed that during his main lecture. How do you improve reliability of your measures? You provide those standardized procedures. I don't say it because I'm mean. I say it because, you know, if you really want to get good, reliable data, you have really strict, well-documented, everybody's trained on them standardized procedures. And I mentioned the training and retraining on a regular basis because sitting on a bookshelf or sitting in a file on your computer does not help produce standardization. You have to have standardized procedures, but then people have to follow them in a standardized manner. And if it's not gonna work, you wanna know that soon. So Kate Stoney was, gave a lecture, but what she was famous for was making her entire study staff run her through the study. She was patient zero of every study when she was a researcher. Why? She's like, well, one, I should know what we're doing the best. And then she actually made some of her other study staff, well, made in quotes, not to upset the consent people, but you know, she was like, everybody's gonna run through it, because one, you need to understand what's gonna be done. If there are any problems or any cons inconsistencies, we wanna figure this out now. And if something's not gonna flow, you wanna do it. So that's part of that standardization, is the training and the fixing when there's a problem. People can't follow your procedures, that's a problem. So you train the raters, you monitor your raters. Anybody who's taking a measurement, anybody who's running people through those study visits, what exactly is happening? Using multiple raters for each rating. That might be as simple as trying to take their blood pressure three times. It might be, so I have this one assessment skill where they're trying to decide how smoothly somebody walks over like, I think it's a 10 meter space. Do you have one gait specialist? Do you have two or three gait specialists? Do you videotape the walking and have that sent for adjudica adjudication? Or every like one out of 10 videos have somebody else look at it to see if they agree with the assessor? You need to think of the ways to try to improve the reliability of your measurement. And you also wanna take repeated observations. So there's a mixture of all of this that leads to improving your reliability. And people say that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes extra staff, or your study could be a bust. Decide which one wastes more of your money and of your patient time. So sensitivity to change, super important here. The ability to detect improvement or worsening, you can assess sensitivity to change with effect size. Remember, I personally hate effect size. Cohen who has this in his book, says he doesn't like effect size either. But when in doubt, you can look at things with effect size if you don't have any other information. Also, if you're thinking like you don't have the variance, you're not really sure what difference matters, P 
people will think about this, but large effect size can be very different things depending on your variance. So usually you want to actually understand what are the two means and what's that standard deviation. Understand that separately. But the general idea that if there's not very big of a difference or it's swamped out by the variance, you're not very sensitive to change. You also need to think about the clinical relevance. I think both Dave and Paul talked about this a bit. It's definitely discussed in your textbook. And because I think it's such an important topic, I can promise you this type of information will be on your exam. So we talk a lot about sensitivity and specificity, right? If you hear about that anytime people are developing a new test, sensitivity if you have the illness, how often is the test positive? Specificity, if you have no illness, how often is the test negative? These are used a lot because they don't depend on disease prevalence. Problem is, if you're a doctor or you're a patient, all you know is that you tested positive or negative. So while sensitivity and specificity are great, that's not the actual question of interest for most folks. What most of us care about are called positive or negative predictive values. If you have a positive predictive value, if you test positive, how often do you have the illness? If you test negative, how often do you have no illness? So if I test positive for HIV, what's the probability I actually have HIV? That is the positive predictive value. However, the formula for that will say, well, if you're in a high-risk population, then you will have a higher positive predictive value. Let's say that you are women in the United States who donate blood, where the probability of being HIV positive, the prevalence in that population is about 0.01%. Even the best HIV tests we have have really bad positive predictive values. So because of that, before they tell you you're positive, they actually split samples, and they do, if you show up positive on the cheap, fast test, then they do the more expensive, longer test to make sure it's a true positive or was it a false positive. Same thing on negative predictive values. There are different risks for each of these, but it's really important if you're trying to roll a test out into the population, you understand positive and negative predictive values you think you're pregnant, you want to know when you peed on that stick, are you positive or negative? Are you pregnant or not pregnant? That's what I really want to know. So instead of laboratory tests, let's talk a little bit about self-report measures. Several of the speakers talked about these. They may be used in questionnaires, some information, just not easily observable. Now some folks will say self-report measures are estimates of true scores because they say, well, they're susceptible. Respondents' mood, their motivation, their memory, their understanding, the context you're collecting the data in, like, am I interviewing you? Or are you writing it down on your own? A social desirability is a big issue. So that gets back to that pain question that I had. Or do I want to tell you that I'm pregnant and I had three drinks of alcohol? Probably not. I know I'm not supposed to do that. So do I lie? Do I tell you the truth? The problem is that people say, well, then self-report measures are just bad. The answer is there are some things you can only figure out by asking people. So the point is the last line. If you use really rigorous methods, you can mitigate a lot of these pitfalls. Not everything can be measured in the blood and urine. And those tests many times have just as many problems. So Kevin Weinford talked about patient reported outcomes or PROs. Sometimes in certain parts of the world they're called PROMs instead of PROs. According to the FDA guidance from December of 2009, these are defined as a measurement based on a report that comes directly from the patient or the study subject about the status of the patient's health condition without being amended or interpreted by a clinician or anyone else. So a PRO is not asking mom about their baby's pain. PRO is not you're having a conversation with your doctor 
and your doctor writing down about your pain. Piero is you directly responding about your pain. He also went through to talk about this kind of balance that Wilson and Cleary had about the dilution of effects of biological intervention and the correlation that can happen. So you have some characteristics of individuals, some characteristics of the environment, and then some biological and phys physiological variables. So you end up with a symptom status, you end up with the functional status, how well are they moving, things like that. Their general health perceptions, and some folks will talk about this overall quality of life, which also has these non-medical factors, right? So there may be financial factors and a lot of other factors that are going in here. But the problem is also like kind of how distal are you measuring from what you actually care about. So in the lecture after that, we talked a little bit about putting together draft questionnaires. And the focus on try to use existing, I would say, good instruments when possible, existing relevant instruments when possible. So Barbara mentioned healthmeasures.net, which has a set of tools developed by the National Institutes of Health. REDCap has a library, so not only does it offer a data management system that's online or electronic for you to use, but it also has a library of a lot of common case report forms and measurement tools. And sometimes people will actually copy questionnaires from national surveys. So in the UK, you have the National Health Service Survey in the United States in Hayes or NHIS. So they'll literally, some of these studies will copy the instructions and the questions and the responses and use those. That can at times be useful because then you can compare your study subjects to the general population. But it's good and there's better and better international agreement to try to have these shared libraries of data collection instruments because it's, then it's going to make Chuck Natans' job doing these meta-analyses a lot easier. So what are the criteria for good survey questions? And I'll tell you, almost all of these apply to whether it's a patient, clinician, or any other type of reported outcome. When you are trying to figure out any way that you're collecting data, in the United States, we tend to say you want literacy below the ninth grade, or some groups will even say below the sixth grade reading level. Depending on the countries you're working in, you may need to lower this limit. The lower you can go, the better. When I have to do this, a lot of times I'll say, let's do pediatrics first, because a 60-year-old will understand what a six-year-old understands. That's, I, I call it my Sesame Street principle. Specific questions are better than broad questions. People are going to be less likely to misinterpret it. You want to be culturally sensitive. It's a huge issue. You need to test in different cultures and in different languages to figure out that people are going to interpret your question and the answer is the same way. And also to make sure, just to be blunt, that you are not being insulting. As happened with one questionnaire I was given and asked to deploy in inner city Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And it was asking about out how to out house usage. So going to a separate facility to use the bathroom. Houses are not used anywhere that I've seen in inner city Philadelphia. People were a little unhappy about me asking that question, and I couldn't blame them. It was a bad questionnaire. Are your scales consistent? Are the terms well-defined? Do I understand what an outhouse even is? Instructions, are they clear? The reference period's clear. You say in the last month, in some countries, people think back just to the first of the month. They don't think back the last four weeks. The response options, do they match the question? Is your question asking about frequency and your response options are all about severity? Not good. Also, the response options that overlap, also not good. Are the multiple concepts separated? We call these sometimes double-barreled questions or things where it's all kind of all on top of each other. Make sure you're separating out all the concepts. You need to make sure 
that your questions will be interpreted accurately by people with a range of different demographic characteristics. It goes for literacy, liter literacy it goes for culture, it goes for age, it goes for different regions inside the same country. If they're male or female, et cetera. And you also need to make sure that it's actually capturing what the researcher intended. One time, I, had, I saw a bunch of qualitative results. Everybody was uniform in what they thought the question and the responses meant. It had nothing to do with what the researcher thought the question and responses meant. So it's like, you know, you, you passed on one part, but you failed to answer the research question, so we got to start over again. As you're trying to develop these questions, you want to try to avoid the social desirability effects, negative wording. You also don't want to like flip-flop back and forth, negative and positive. Doesn't help, just confuses people. Old school said you had to do that. New school says, why are you confusing? That double barrel type of question, jargon. I may say something here. Some of our folks that are listening that have perfectly good English in Egypt I have no idea what I mean. We used to joke, there's one of those little online, I will interpret your language. I was back in Texas this weekend, and it didn't understand my cousin, who has a very strong North Texas accent. So you have to pick up a lot of different elements. You don't want ambiguous questions. Be really precise. And you don't want any leading questions. So if you're going to ask me, oops going to ask me about how much I drank, make sure someone's not going to be judging me. And you also don't want to say, understanding that you shouldn't be drinking during pregnancy, how much alcohol did you have this weekend? Like, you, know, you got to be careful about these things. What about that development evaluation of PRO measures? Well, again, Kevin was talking about what is the concept you actually want to measure and why? It's a different variation on what is your question. You've got to collect that qualitative data to understand the meaning of the PRO concept. So again, just like a survey, right? You've got to write items that you think will measure the concept. You've got to test the items for understanding. That happens in those cognitive interviews. Then you're going to administer the items to a large sample of people. And then you use something called psychometric analyses, which are a form of statistical analyses to see how well the items are working and you've got to develop a scoring method. Trick, do not just assign them all one, two, three, four, or like zero through four, and assume the spacing between zero and one, one and two, et cetera, the same. A lot of times you have to have weighting in the scores. And you've got to evaluate the reliability and validity of the measure, which leads you back to Dave's talk. Barbara wanted me to also remind you all for translations. So PROMIS, which was the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System, has a paper on this, but it's a poor, so there's an international society that has a paper on this. They all pretty much come along the same way. The idea being you need to harmonize, use different words and languages. You have to still have that same meaning. Now, even though there are a lot of different idioms, I speak both Spanish and English, you can come up with a lot of different phrases, but then there's what we jokingly call the television English or the television Spanish that the newscasters use. Everybody actually understands what they mean, and we don't confuse a baby with a bus, baby carriage with a bus. So there's certain words that everyone will know what you mean, even though they may not be the most commonly used words inside that language. So you've got to develop this harmonization because you don't want to have and if you can avoid it at all, different questions in England, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Nor do you want them in Spanish versions used in the U.S., Mexico, Argentina, and Spain. You want to try to have as much harmonization in this universal approach as possible. When you have people from various countries, different dialects, or when I was in South Africa, I forget if it was 13 or 14 different official languages, you have to think, what is it that everyone will understand? So Kevin also talked about item banks. Sometimes instead of giving everybody the exact same questions, if you're trying to measure, say, their physical function, you may have a large collection of items that are measuring that single concept or domain. Let's say physical function. 
Any and all items can be used to provide the score for that domain. And what's nice about an IDA bank is that it's dynamic, it's not fixed. So if you have patients that during the course of your study are going to be able to not get themselves out of bed, but later on are going to be walking around and doing a lot of things, you may want to use an item bank instead of a fixed questionnaire. Because if you use a fixed questionnaire to cover that broad range of physical function, you're asking a lot of questions if you want to have any sensitivity. So he showed you this example that Bryce Reeve put together, the physical functioning item bank. So you see you have people that are in bed to your folks that are doing the Tour de France and you know, the running marathons, et cetera. So sometimes in the military, it's going to really matter whether you can run 26 miles or run five miles. For most of us, it's just a question like, can you run or can you only walk, right? So it depends kind of where you're doing your research, what your population is, how much of this scale you care about. Problem is some of the tools, some of those PROs that you might use as patient-reported outcomes only measure on very small portions of the scale. So it could be very useful to use something that's very broad in order to also be able to compare all the studies to each other over time. So traditional classical test theory-based PRO measure you need all the items in order to compute a score. Use an item bank, any or all subsets of items can create a score. This is nice also if you think about patient burden, kind of they can answer one to three items, you have a score. Everyone has to take the same number of items in that traditional measurement scheme. With an item bank, different people can get different items. Traditional, off the shelf, item banks, you need to create a measure for specific use. So you can still create kind of a fixed number if you want. Traditional scores are not easily comparable. And in an item bank, it's easier to do crosswalks. So maybe there are six different ways to ask about that running. You can do that and crosswalk and still compare scores. I think he also talked about that differential item functioning. This is a big issue for surveys and PROs, but it comes up a lot in the scores for the patient reported outcomes. That an item behaves differently for two or more groups. This may be language groups, it might be sex, can be age, a lot of different issues. So let's say that map between depression and a crying item is different. This is the classic way to talk about what's called diff or differential item functioning. In the past seven days, did you cry? So how you're going to actually score in having a depressed mood, depending on how you answer that question, for males versus females is very different. Women have a tendency to cry more, regardless of their depressed mood. So the probability that you say that you cried in the past seven days, that it's yes, in order to get the same level of depression, you have to be at 90% here, whereas the men is 30%. Basically, as soon as the man says that he cried in the past seven days, you start triggering that this person might have depression. It's not true for all men. It's not true for all women. But we're talking about these population issues. You develop these curves using a lot of people. So typically, we would throw that question out, or we would score it differently for men and women. So in summary, with your dealing with measurement, you've got this questionnaire development. requires a lot of careful planning. You have existing validated instruments. When possible, use them. Let somebody else do all that work, unless that is all the work that you want to do. Rigorous methods reduce your response error. It pays to be rigorous here. Again, things that can really screw up your study results, measurement, huge issue. So is who you select. There is a research continuum to a clinical trial that Dr. Stoney talked to you about. Kind of how big is the study? Who's involved? Now, phase one is not always healthy. Sometimes, like in cancer trials, they're the very unhealthy. But phase one in a lot of studies, you use healthy humans and see if you cause any problems. Then we give it to the less healthy people. But how much control you have varies on this continuum. And there's this constant balance of, am I trying to maximize my generalizability? So am I more worried about false positives? Or am I trying to maximize my control? And I'm trying to really worry about the false negatives. 
they're different times that you're going to be thinking about different things. Someone like me almost always wants to maximize generalizability because I see what happens when I maximize my control. It usually means I had the wrong results and I screw up. But other people think it's super important early in research to maximize that control. But as long as you're trying to choose who's in what study, your number one reason you have exclusion criteria, regardless of the type of study, is safety. If I cannot randomize somebody, I've got some computer randomizing it. Chuck used to always blame me as a statistician. I was like, no, you have told me who can be in this study, and I assume they can be in any arm of your study. If it is not safe for them to be in that study, you should be excluding them. And I'm not talking about some like metaphysical, I'm a little worried, blah, blah, blah. I mean, like, they really shouldn't be receiving any of these study arms or one of these study arms. you got to make sure they don't get that study arm because my computer doesn't do, you know, it does, it's not a doctor. It doesn't know that. But I also try to reduce potential confounding. This is where that maximizing control also comes in, but you don't want to overdo it. So what are some of the secondary data? Think about where data comes from. It might be primary data, so that's what you get generated directly for those research purposes. And in many cases, that includes those disease registries and national surveys, but you also get the secondary data. So I'm not talking about the secondary data analysis of primary data. This is stuff like administrative, billing, electronic health record type of data. So if you have a national health care system, in the United States, even if you think about Medicare, Medicaid, we collect data because we are paying for that care. Different countries, this data is of higher or lesser quality. The United States, I'm not saying has very high quality on some of this. But it's often generated, the secondary data, they're thinking about healthcare utilization. What you have to make sure is do you have enough data? and of high enough quality to actually make a meaningful population-based conclusion. So why does Leighton study these Medicare patients? Because in the United States, and really in the world, Medicare is the largest purchaser of health care. Part of that is the cost of health care in the US. But we also have 54 million enrollees and spend more than half a trillion dollars in 2014 in this program alone. So this is a huge amount of money out of the U.S. system. So if you're trying to study the United States, it's a good place to start. If you're trying to study your own country, there's also additional information in a lot of other places and a lot of groups around the world that try to compare these different countries, right? It's also nice in the United States is for the most part, we've got 20 million different data systems. Medicare has one data system. So Leighton went through kind of all the benefits of using Medicare data, what you want to do. And that this is a place, again, you measure that effectiveness because this is healthcare in action. What are people actually prescribing? There are a lot of limitations. You know, we don't have that much data on the severity of the illness. These tend to not be the working population in the United States. These are very different. You can't extrapolate to the U.S. as a whole. You can't extrapolate to other countries. There are a lot of errors and bias that happen in this. So people will code in order to make sure that something gets paid for. Or they just write down the wrong number. You have limited outcome measures of interest. But it's still useful data or a place to start. So you may have all these observational studies. You might not be avoiding your selection bias. You have a lot of other issues, but it can give you some hypotheses to start testing. If you want Medicare administrative billing or encounter data, he gives you the website. If you are saying, well, I want to know this about Egypt, I want to know this about some other place, you want to look in your own country for similar type of information. And you may want to share it on the online chat board so that other people know where to find that information. But there are also countries that are trying to put this type of information together, or collectives of countries in many continents that are trying to put this information together. Because a lot of times we need to try to understand how healthcare is working 
and a collaborative environment, not just a bunch of individual work. So briefly, for hypothesis testing, bottom line, statistical inference uses the results from a sample for the population of interest to draw conclusions about the population. I don't just care about the little individuals in my study. I want a bigger picture. The null hypothesis is set up with the hope that you're going to reject it. If you can't figure out how to write your null hypothesis, just remember that. That alpha or that type 1 error that's the chance of making that type 1 error, right? It's the probability of concluding that there is a difference when, in fact, there is not a difference. Beta is the chance of making a type 2 error. So it's the chance of concluding that there is not a difference when, in fact, there is. And power is 1 minus beta. Unless you're in parts of Europe, in which case they flip it, just always remember, you do not want high error rates. You do want high power. So that power is the chance of concluding there is a difference when, in fact, there is. That's your whole goal. Investigator controls the chance of making a type 1 error and the chance of making that type 2 error with your sample size. So I'm going to say, what are my parameters? What am I willing to make? What errors am I willing to make? And I'm going to derive a sample size. The p-value is the probability of obtaining a result as extreme or more extreme than the one obtained if there were no difference. So under that null hypothesis, these are all assuming superiority. You've got statistical significance. Doesn't mean clinical importance. Confidence intervals are useful to better understand your results. And the multiplicity adjustments needed with more than one primary hypothesis for those phase three trials. Phase two and earlier, we sometimes let you get away with it without worrying about it. But that Bayesian approach is gaining popularity. It's more intuitive, it's worth considering but again, you've got to have people trained who know what they're doing in order to pull that off. So what about the sample size? There are lots of different sample size formulas, which I mentioned on the next slide. But just remember, changes in that difference you want to detect in the type 1 error you're willing to accept or the type 2 error, changes in the variance, the number of samples you're collecting, if you're going to do a one- or two-sided test, all of that impacts your sample size calculation. So this is the basic formula for a two-arm study, but depending on your study design, you're going to probably have to do simulations. So just remember, though, the basics that power is affected by all these different elements. We talked about that extensively and gave a lot of examples about that in the sample size and power lecture. So when in doubt, first, what is your question? What is your hypothesis test that you want to run? Now I can get an idea of what that formula should be or the simulations I have to run. I'm going to make some type of table, whether I have a fixed sample size and I want to figure out the power I'm going to have with that, or whether I'm going to see the different sample sizes I should have depending on how I vary the standard deviation, the type 1 error, all these other things. You might want a graph. You might want a lot of graphs. This is not a single number. Sample size, in the end, you're going to choose a single number, but you've got to look at and evaluate a lot of numbers to figure out, if I screwed up one of my assumptions, how much does it hurt me? When in doubt, go high on sample size. Survival analysis. We're making inference and survival about the event rates. It's a little different than some of the other hypothesis tests that we're talking about when it's like logistic regression, et cetera. Survival analysis, basically that rate at some time t, is the rate among those who are at risk at time t. That was that idea that independence was key. You have to have independent censoring and of competing risks. Big trick, you will always look at median survival. Next to never do you look at mean survival, because mean survival means everyone had the event, and that next to never happens. Cox regression is your most robust method. Kaplan-Meier curves do not have sensible interpretation for competing risks, even though they're lovely creatures. Independence of your measurements and of those outcomes is key. Also remember, truncation is about entering the study and censoring is about leaving the study. And someone asked an additional question on the survival analysis lecture. It's one of the first questions about one of the examples I gave. Go back and read the board about that question. I wrote an answer about that. Um, in order to try to clarify this topic. 
So John Powers, one of his last slides, I thought was a pretty good conclusion to this first module of the course. You're trying to develop an efficient trial, and that all starts with planning and a good research question. Everything starts there. Your question always comes first. Then you're going to deal with sample size and everything else. But if you can't come up with a sample size to answer the question that matters, you shouldn't do the study. I'm going to be honest with you. Various methods are going to help increase your effect size, decrease the variability of your measures. You can apply it in a different setting. You want to get valid, reliable answers to important public health questions. All of these things we talk about is try to get you to that end. And for some diseases, it is going to be really important to develop the tools to develop the better outcome measures, to get better data in natural history, to better understand what you're dealing with before you do all the other trials. A good start to better trials, making sure you can actually measure an outcome that matters and you can do it reliably and with high validity. It's understanding your patient population, how they're going to change over time, doing good natural history studies in order to better plan your randomized studies. But always, always, always remember that your analysis follows design. That question always comes first. Now, your exam questions on this module will go beyond what I'm talking about tonight. But this is a brief summary. And so hopefully that was useful to you. And if you think it's just all about medicine, as I was on the plane, I was reading the latest economists from 12 December 2015. I guess some of y'all might listen to this a few years from now. So it was the latest from my plane trip. And they were talking about randomized control trials. They have two different articles I've given the URLs to. And one was talking about more of editorial style. Doctors use evidence when prescribing treatments. Policymakers should too. And they were referring to an article where some of these government organizations are giving out livestock and and teaching people how to use the livestock, and is that actually improving and moving the very, very poor up in their status? And they were talking about the fact that you can use randomized controlled trials, and in fact, this group out of MIT and other groups are using randomized trials to test everything. And so they've gone in and they've done randomized trials to test if I give people a cow, if I give them goats, and I teach them how to try to raise them, does that, in fact, mean that they are in less poverty five years or 10 years later? You can do a trial on almost anything. So what we've talked about here, while it's in a clinical context, can be used in lots and lots of different situations. The basic tenets are the same. Now, another friend of mine died last week and that was Norm Breslow. And I'm going to talk about him a little bit because he also was one of the founding members of the Wilms Tumor Study Group. So this is a pediatric cancer that at the beginning of the 20th century, 90% of children diagnosed with it died. Beginning of the 21st century, nearly 90% not only survived, but led relatively normal lives well into adulthood. What they did over 40 plus years with the study groups, they refined treatments and they started looking at the long-term effects of radiation and chemotherapy on patients. Everybody across all disciplines, not just the oncologists, were full members of this cooperative group. It was one of the first cooperative groups to do that. And Norm worked with a lot of epidemiologists and a lot of other folks. And they placed a very high priority on data collection electronic data capture, really careful follow-up and registering all the patients with this relatively rare disease. The pathologists were able to do work with that data and they actually developed that case control match sample design that's discussed in the textbook that helps inform your later longitudinal cohort studies. So they've done a lot of different trials over the year if you wanna read through them. But I think one of the important ideas that came out of this was, was it ethical? So now they have increased survival, that patients 
women that have had Wilms tumor, they were not able to have healthy pregnancies or healthy children. There were a lot of additional tumors happening relatively early in life, whether it was breast cancers or other types of cancers. So they did randomized studies to lower the dose of radiation. Can you imagine being that parent and how scared you are that your child isn't going to be cured when you know they can be? There are a lot of ethics that go into these studies and a lot of people who put their lives on the line for this. So that's what you're talking about next. Good luck. If you have questions, put them on the board for the lecture. And good luck with the rest of your course and all of your work. Take care. Thanks.